the, the, the less you have to wait, uh, the better off you'll be. Like, it's less frustrating as well. And like, uh, it's like opening a bag of chips, right? If it, like, let, let's pretend the chips in the bag are the thing that you want to achieve statistically or is your goal. But at the same time, like, you're distracted and stuff. So if it takes like two minutes to open a bag of chips, you probably don't want the chips anymore. But most chips, like, you can open it instantly and like, you can instantly gratify yourself. Hey everyone, please welcome Nicholas Lim. Nicholas is a freelance concept designer hailing from Malaysia. He's been part of the LearnSquared community for many years and we've often competed with each other via the LearnSquared challenges. In fact, it was an interview we did with him after one of these very challenges that led to the genesis of this very podcast. In this episode, we discuss how the impact of the global pandemic has affected freelance life so far and how pushing his creative boundaries has seen Nicholas set foot into the world of 3D printing. Strap yourselves in and let's go. Uh, yeah, welcome, sure. Nicholas, welcome, Nicholas Lim. Um, good to have you back on. Um, obviously, we say back on, but anyone who's listening to this right now is probably thinking this is the first time we've seen this episode. Um, the reason why I say that is because about a year and a half ago, me and Nicholas recorded an episode for our Discord channel. Um, sorry, a Discord server back about a year and a half ago. And for those that are on the discord are probably familiar with our challenges that we we host um, every now and again and nicholas was a winner of a few of them and we decided to start having a podcast or like a chat um with the winner just to see get to know them better as artists and that's where we probably first had a conversation last year um, so if anyone's on the Discord, they can hear that on there. Um, and I was thinking about releasing that instead. However, a year and a half has passed. A lot has happened since then. Um, not just obviously in the world, but in terms of, I guess, our personal lives and even as artists. And I've also noticed that recently you've dropped a lot of new projects. Um, so I thought, why not just record a new episode and get to catch up and obviously we can retread some of the old ground we did back then but yeah nicholas say hello to everybody and um let everybody know who you are hey everybody uh so yeah thanks thanks for having me on aaron um it's great to speak to you again and you're right uh i, I did drop a lot of um new stuff it's been a while since we've spoken so yeah um i've really doubled down on the 3d uh more 3d stuff i uh, if uh if you're looking at the uh, so-called art station and that kind of stuff. Mm. So I've recently got into um, 3D printing as well because um, I yeah, really do have... I uh, get into that. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, because when you do have um, the, the high-level 3D models or just some capability with anything really, like these days, everybody's on Blender, so you can totally do that as well. I did use mm. Blender for some uh, Mount Miniature Sculpting. And you can throw on anything onto the printer, support it, and then there's something physical in your hands. There's something very rewarding about that. Um, I, I feel like a kid in a toy store. Like um, it, It's yet another step removed from, you know, just coming out with an idea, and then like that idea is in your hands. It's yeah. really fun, especially if I, I'm just like printing out miniatures and stuff. It's so cool. So is this, um, in fact, uh, I think I saw that on your, it's not on your art station yet, is it? But I can see it here. Uh, yeah, there is something on it. And, and your on your okay. IG. So um Nicholas Lim Art. We'll put the link in the in the notes below in the description. So oh, check on his Instagram. Um and yeah, you can see uh, it's Warhammer, right? Yes, uh it's uh Games Workshops uh Warhammer forty thousand. Yeah, man. So you can see he's like three D printed uh figures. And um because I'm I'm familiar with Nicholas, so um i'm always aware that he's always doing he does a lot of things to be fair um but he definitely spends a lot of time on hard surface weapons um mm -hmm. even on the challenges we had like the uh the crate challenge and you made some awesome sci-fi cases um so you know what you're doing when it comes to hard surface and i believe last time we spoke we were speaking about fusion 360 and moi 3d 
Yes. Um, me particularly, I've uh, more on the. Fu- I've never tried Moi properly yet, um, but something mm. I want to get into. Um, but Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty is the one that I use. But obviously, I know that you have used. Well, you can tell by the the viewport renders that that's definitely Moi. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you mentioned earlier about 3D printing. Um, for those that uh, would like to get into 3D printing but not sure how, if you pick up e- either Fusion 360 or Moi 3D, um, they're basically like, I guess you can call it, mainly built for like the CAD world. Um, so stuff that's built for the design to be built for the real world. And um, from there, you can pretty much directly hit a button and send it to a 3D printer. Is that pretty much what you did? Um, it's a little bit more involved than that, but you're right mm-hmm. about the uh, the real applications. Because um, when you have these like uh, so-called CAD design softwares like Moi and Fusion, you you can actually like um, have a lot of precision when it comes to <clears throat> sorry the measurements and like the the size of the fillets that kind of thing. Yeah, like you found the rounded <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the the chamfers and rounded edges that kind of thing. You've got a lot of control over those things, and those things don't really show up uh, if you print it at a certain size, certainly. But um, it's nice to know that you have a bit of material to play with when it comes to the rounded edges and that kind of thing. Lots of small refinements that really do add up when you um, scale it down. Even even when even in the actual print, um, some of those like refined edges are actually like well appreciated. Like, you have to really look at it, though. Um, it's good fun. But to be honest, you can actually use Blender and Maya if you've got any kind of 3D model Correct. Uh, that doesn't have some missing vertices or geometry. You can still print it out successfully. Okay. It's more about like into like there is this program. Um, I think every uh, 3D printer needs to go through like a so-called slicing program. It doesn't matter who makes it, but I see. Uh, okay. the one is called Cheetah Box. Um, it's re- it's really like uh, common these days because all the resin printers apparently use this. If you're not using Formlabs, you're using this program called Cheetah Box Three, mm-hmm. and it's like designed to work with just about every major 3D printer that's out there. So, so once you have that, it has supports, and then uh, you'll process the file, and then off you go. You'll start printing for you. So um, why 3D print? Like, is that something you've wanted to do for a while, or what, yeah, um, it's, what led you to doing 3D printing now? Well. Uh, the, the main factor was really um, what well, well, several factors actually. Um, back in the day, um, because I like it's, you can see, like I'm a big fan of Warhammer stuff. Mm-hmm. So, if you want like specific parts, or if you have something like if it's like a specific idea that's depicted in a story, and Games Workshop, which is uh, you know the owner of this IP, they haven't made something that's specific to it. You can always mm-hmm. come up with your own idea. Or you can make a modification that suits your tastes, mm-hmm. and you can print it out. Uh, as I have, I guess, uh, most people, um, they can just download files, on it, which are offered for free as well. Okay. Uh, make alterations, remix it, and then they can print out something that's fairly unique, I think. So the other factor was um, the fact that 3D printers, resin printers anyway, um, the really messy but uh, more precise ones, they've really come down in costs because of the uh, uh, market competition, right? Mm-hmm. So there are a ton of these. There were a ton of these. Like um, if you if you started like three D printing a few years ago, maybe like within the last three or five years, like the top two were maybe the uh the Elegoo Mars and the uh Anycubic Photon. I I'm not sure if you heard of those, Aaron. Um no, but to be fair, okay. I haven't really um researched much into three D printers. Oh yeah, but anyway, um those two were like um they're kind of they were kind of like competing neck and neck like the market share and stuff mm-hmm. and now you have a whole bunch of them and i just picked the one that was a really low cost one and it printed quick as well because the technology is evolving like the internal components they're changing things out so that you can print things out faster and quicker mm. easier to get everything going as well because back uh you had to do like all the calibrations on your own or something and okay. this at this point like it's much easier to do it like it's more user-friendly right yeah, and I was, was just really going to say, like, is yeah. it pretty much plug and play so you can kind of, like, how long did it take you once you, like, how long have you had a 3D printer for now? I've had a 3D printer for just about a month. Uh, oh, okay. Because I did a lot of research beforehand. Mm. I watched a lot of YouTube videos. And that's the thing as well, like, there's an explosion of YouTube videos um, and articles 
which allow you to understand some of the properties and stuff. So that really, really helps. So that once I got it, like I was kind of going in blind, like I had some, uh, what do you call it? I had some foreknowledge, I guess, like some pitfalls to avoid, that kind of thing. Yeah. And with your, so is this like your first print or did you have like other test prints just to test it out? Or is this like, Um, I guess this is your first proper print yeah, this is the first to a project, that right? Uh, but it's technically the second model I printed. The first model I printed, um, I left I left the first print. It was a successful print, but I left it out too long in the sun, and I think it's cracked a little bit. Because, <laughs> what, yeah, it's really weird because, like, um, th- this this printing method, it, you're printing using resin, right? Okay. And it cuts things up using, like, uh, the, the so-called SLA method. So everything that you model out in 3D, once it goes through the so-called slicing program, mm-hmm. it kind of looks like an MRI, all those like yeah, little yeah, like yeah, slabs. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, so it's like all those little pieces and it builds it using the ultraviolet light. Okay. It takes up all the shit and like you have the final product, but you have to clean it all on alcohol and then you have to put it in sunlight or you can put it under an ultraviolet lamp. So this one, I left it in the sun a little too long and uh, it did get a bit too brittle i guess so some some of the parts started flicking off and so this like is the most image here which i think it's like about four three and a half cent four centimeters i guess yeah it's a it's a miniature all right and it's um, under, how long yeah. did that take to print this guy took about three hours to print which is apparently pretty fast yeah, yeah i was just gonna say that in two but it's like i probably had renders that take longer than that so <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Be good. me too <laughs> But um, I mean, yeah, I, I can imagine really, like obviously, if you're doing like biggest, biggest scales and whatnot, obviously it can the, the the printing times can be a lot greater. Um, yeah. But um, and like in terms of the material of it, um, is that like the the standard? Like, is it how does it work? Like with the resin, is it do you choose what colors you have, or does it come with this particular type? um certainly like um different resins have different properties like uh they need to be cured differently like um the ultraviolet light needs to hit them for a specific amount of time some of them take it better like um if you cure it longer but some of them apparently go funny if you do it for too long uh, as i discovered <laughs> uh so yeah uh it, it, in fact um there are some transparent resins this one is not transparent. it's um it's a gray one that's designed to take detail at uh at the the smaller scale so it's best suited for miniatures like what i'm doing here and like i can see there's like different different parts of it um did that mm. all print in like in one go and you just obviously pulled it apart or were they all individual prints well um i put them onto the same uh well they were all printed simultaneously right um from the printer yeah, at the yeah, same time okay, so I mean, yeah. Hours, yeah but i did separate the parts because it's Apparently, it's easier to remove the parts and to maintain some of the details because otherwise they'll go funny when they uh because remember they're all liquid when you start printing so mm. in order to solidify and you know have the parts get out of each other's way it's best to keep them apart even for um even for the small scale that makes sense man um and like yeah so for, like in terms of this particular I mean you've You've painted them, is that, is that correct? And these images here. Oh yeah. Um yeah. part of the Warhammer hobby is like just painting your own stuff. Uh you can paint them whatever you want, but I did paint it according to some of the stuff that I saw in the official artwork. So this is sort okay. of my take on it. Yeah. This is I really do enjoy like the 40k is this stuff. The same because I'm I'm not too familiar on like uh Warhammer and stuff. But this is that mm-hmm. same character in that is it the Astartes? um yeah YouTube yeah uh, if you've seen the uh studies thing on youtube um which is a fantastic uh group of videos right um yeah, he's yeah, the yeah. same actually like, same sort of dude they're also so called like, different Marine. classes and uh or whatever else different squads or whatever they call them right yeah they have different like squads chapters um the chapters are like cool. yeah um they're just like different like subsects of like space marines mm. so sometimes you can see like the the really common one is like the blue one yeah. The blue space marines like everywhere, and then like you have green ones, red ones, like they can be whatever color really. So sure. obviously, um, like you mentioned of, earlier, you can add your own spin to it and do your own flavors and stuff. Oh like yeah, that. yeah. Sweet. Man. You can actually come up with your own army. Like uh, you can paint them whatever you want, and the rules for the game will uh will support you to a certain extent, which is the nice thing. They really do encourage like the hobby side. Yeah. Um. Where where I live, like, I think they are a British company. I think Games Workshop. Yeah, um, they're in Nottingham, man. 
I went to visit them a few years ago. Oh, um, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I think some of the stores have closed now, but I remember as a kid, you just walk past and mm -hmm. like you see all these cool little miniatures and you see in the shop people painting them. And I thought, like, whoa, that's a cool toy shop. Then you realize it's not like a toy shop because of the, the yeah. detail. It's like, it's almost like even, even when I was that young, it's like with a toy, you want to pick it up. You want to push it to its limits and see what it can do. And then what not with yeah. these, you could tell they were so detailed and they weren't delicate, but you almost felt like, okay, you don't want to be touch careful. these because you're probably going to kind of ruin them. Um, So you could even tell like growing up, like the craftsmanship involved, it, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, And like, so how do you think this would affect your art approach now, now that you're into 3D printing and you've had a successful print? I, do you have like, have you caught the bug now and you want to do a ton more of these or like what's your, what's your goal with these? Ah, well, to answer your question, uh, if I've caught that bug, um, I'm afraid so. Uh, I'm actually designing like um, a medical robot on my blog, on my station blog. Like there's a robot that I'm doing. So I'm thinking of making that as well. Um, I, I've I've designed that somewhat with 3D printing in mind. Mm. So there is like a, yeah, you can see the mm. legs and the body. I've designed That's them separately cool. so that I can print them separately and uh, post them differently. Actually, I may like, even try and commercialize them. Yeah, like yeah, have cause a because you, you do hard surface anyway. It's almost like an an obvious thing because yeah. um, anyone who does hard surface and has a solid model, like you mentioned earlier, it is pretty yeah. much ready to 3D print. Um, if you want mm -hmm. to do so. Um, so it seems like a natural progression in terms of knowing your work. Um, yeah. Uh, with, with these models, like at the moment, are these mainly for yourself or do you have a plan for them? Like, do you want to sell these or um, what, what's the what's the strategy, if, if, if any? Well, uh, at the very least, I have to get these up for myself because, um, you know, with uh, most of the professional work they've done for like my freelancing, I, I can't show anything just yet. Mm. It's literally too slow, like uh, especially now with the virus clamping everything down, everything slowed down. Mm. So I won't be able to show anything new for a while. So I have to, I have to, you know, do this for myself really. Cool. And then after, like, I'm done designing, you know, I'm gonna do like the normal treatment of like, um, you know, doing the materials, rendering this out like nicely in Octane, that kind of thing. And then uh, I'll put it back into like uh, 3D and have 3D printing in mind. Uh, I'll try and commercialize this like uh, once everything settles down, like. Uh, like I, I don't know if I'll three D print every single like a uh, uh, box full of models because mm. as far as I know, three D printing is just used for like prototyping and that kind of thing or like right. uh, just getting the master thing out. Because yeah. like some of these major companies out there, they do three D printing and then once that's done, they have this master model that's cleaned up perfectly and separated in pieces, right? And yeah. then they cast it in like more resin or like the injection mold yeah. it somehow. Uh, it really depends on their capabilities. But for me, it's probably gonna be. Uh, those so-called like garage kits or like a uh, small-scale manufacturing sort of things, yeah, yeah, like yeah. something that home, something that's more manageable for like uh, one person to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess you can say like yeah, at the garage, moment yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of hobbyist, um, but at the same time you're yeah. kind of like figuring it out, figuring it out, and see see what can come of it. But now that's cool, man. It's like um, when I've been very interested in getting into this. Um, oh yeah. But it's just a case of. Firstly, finding the time, and then I need a bit of space as well. Um, but um, in a similar sense, I think there's some some designs that I've got that could be better presented as a 3D printing, uh, as something 3D printed. Yeah, so I'll definitely, yeah. definitely be keeping you an eye on um, what you're up to. Hmm. I mean, if you want, you can always. Um, I'm sure there are some 3D printing services out there, like even like uh, Shapeways or Formlabs. They might uh, yeah, yeah. they might take your model and do stuff. Yeah, well, remember, be, yeah, yeah, there's a few. Um, I, I was just going to actually ask, actually, like, have, did you even look into that? Like, did you ever think of um, using those services first? Or um, was it still like, do you something wanted to achieve your, like, achieve yourself first? Yeah, that was the thing. I, I, I did look at, like, uh, shape ways and stuff. Um, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm living in Malaysia, so it's a little far to have the physical product mailed back to me. It costs, like, maybe mm. 26 dollars or something so for that amount of money i can buy like uh i can buy an actual like warhammer miniature or something like uh by itself so the shipping cost was uh, put off and i think certainly like um you know you're paying professionals to do their thing 
Correct. And it will probably cost like a, a decent amount of money. And it's just to have the uh, the thing modeled uh, or cleaned up, that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, with the way things are going, it might be nice to have a handle on that myself. Mm. And it turns out it, it wasn't so bad. You know, the, there's a yeah, wealth right. of knowledge for free on YouTube. There's so many people who are so generous with their knowledge, um, like 3D Printing Pro, like Uncle mm. Jesse, a bunch of other channels that I can't think of right now, but uh, they, are, they know who they are, I guess. Um, lots yeah, I and lots of out there it, because it reminds me of like it's like um any kind of community or thing that has like um like you can be an enthusiast of it there's always seems to be a lot of knowledge like even in like cars or um building mm -hmm. computers and whatnot there's like a, a, a wealth of knowledge online and sometimes you have to like you know um go through a lot of it because there's a lot of noise out there oh, yeah. but then there's a lot of content and everyone seems to be very open to sharing like their knowledge and you know like tips and whatnot so now that's that's pretty sweet and um and it's like so let, let's talk about it from like a, a designer and an artist perspective um I think, sure. so like now you've printed in 3d and you've already mentioned yeah. that you've printed in a certain way because it's easier to keep maintain the details and whatnot um yeah so when did you finish this project or like this this last print like when did you um this it. one was finished about maybe three weeks ago um weeks the ago. whole thing yeah but the actual like model itself i i finished it before i got the printer because um well because again because of the virus like slowing down the yeah the uh, shipping and stuff yeah there were some delays to be expected but that's fine uh, any, anyway it, it wouldn't have mattered because like um i would not have printed if i didn't get like uh all my ducks in a row so to speak mm. so i need to get all the information down like i need to understand like what causes failures in prints because that's that's the real killer. Like it can actually spoil the machine if you uh oh, really? have a free floating piece of um solid I solid stuff inside of your vat because it will crush mm -hmm. the um L C D screen inside. There are a lot oh, of technical things, but there are some safety issues to be aware of, like um you know, handling the resin, which is um which is actually kind of scary. Like I I'm not sure like how some of these people handle it because they do have a dedicated room mm -hmm. and they have to lock it like their, their kids or their pets from messing with it even mm. even they get uh careless with it sometimes so you know protective gear is uh recommended you definitely would need to wear gloves at least open the window that kind of thing and, uh, and it's just a drop resin like it won't kill you but it's kind of noxious you know have, like, you, the have you started on any project since this one's been done in the last three weeks uh, why well, yes there there is one uh i'm using on blender i think uh because i did take up blender um last year mm -hmm. just to mess around with it in, yeah. in fact like a you can use any 3d program like i said like it, it doesn't matter yeah, like yeah, yeah. use maya max uh fusion 360 and moi they're not necessarily like um suited for it but the, the way we use it like we can get more detail or we can you know uh we can restore some of the uh, choices that we made mm. because with fusion, we have the parametrics and you can go back in time to a choice mm -hmm. that you I uh, wanted to preserve, which is great. Um, but anyway, so uh, um, now that you've like obviously mm -hmm. you've designed had, something, yeah. um, you've built it, you've obviously got it printed, and you just mentioned a few technical things. Not even technical things in terms of your actual design, but obviously in terms of the in the, obviously the manufacturing process in terms of the way you've built it. Um, you obviously mentioned yeah. things like health and safety and the things that you can how it can damage actual printer itself. So on the subsequent projects you've had, how has it mm -hmm. affected you as a designer? Like, is it starting to change the way you make choices or not so much? Um, it hasn't changed too much because like um, the core fundamentals or like the, the way I design stuff, like uh, I have to, even when I'm presenting stuff in like Octane, like if I'm going to do like some kind of insane, like high detail render and stuff, I still need to take care of the small details and the only thing that happens when it comes to 3D printing is the final scale of the final product, right? So mm. it really depends on how much you want to preserve, right? Mm. Because when you scale down, like if you look at my Space Marine, like his fingers, I did like um, some detailing on the fingers and stuff. You can see ridges where the digits yeah. are. Yeah. But on the final print, like it, they're not even like sausages, you know, they're, they're just so thin. Okay. Yeah. So but it doesn't change too it, much. If it was scaled up, you'd probably see more of that right yeah if you print at a larger scale it's gonna be preserved like almost perfectly the printer is mm. quite powerful for what it is 
But the, the, the Eagles, actually, yeah, like, yeah. Um, were... what you mentioned before, like I mean, even the last chat, I remember now, like in terms of you speaking about your workflow and yeah. you're big on like your research and figuring out um, the different components before yeah. you jump in. Like you're big on mood boards. Is that correct? Is that still the case? I still am. Yeah. Um, it's a big deal. Like um, speaking of workflow, if you want to, if you want to take a look at the, um, the, the, the Gatling gun that I did last year, that one mm. had a huge amount of research. Like I, I still can't believe like how much time I spent on the, just the research alone. Um, oh, this one, yeah. Because that one's available on my blog and uh, the actual page as well. So I did like a sort of play by play when I was doing it because I wanted to, you know, I wanted to keep like uh, keep something on my on my what do you call it my my social media yeah yeah and I wanted to have my goal for like doing this kind of things like oh I started it I guess I have to finish it sort of thing mm, yeah true yeah, keep yourself so accountable right yeah. hmm? sorry yeah uh, to keep yourself accountable like just a way to yeah, put stuff out there to make sure you get stuff sure done yeah because it was taking so long like I uh, I almost gave up several times because of how much detail was involved yeah yeah, yeah the real I've, Definitely the real thing from that on my end um but sorry yeah carry on yeah because the real thing like speaking of research and stuff um just getting the right amount of information to, to study this real thing this like in, incredibly complex like mechanical mm-hmm. item i had to look at all the pictures and you know sometimes the pictures just aren't enough you really do have to have uh somebody like video taking a video of like the actual item and like walking around mm-hmm. maybe have some diagrams of uh or manuals of how these items are like uh, maintained and stuff because uh some of the diagrams that we see online of these like uh, military items yeah they were like loosely simplified or translated so that the layman can understand them right i mean the stuff there if you really zoom in and you want to reproduce like uh the actual device you wouldn't know what it is because Mm -hmm. you know they they didn't really know what it was because it was a quick job Uh, i mean i'm not but people down but you know it is what it is like they, they got only the important information down and everything else which i need by the way um was fortunately missing so i had to keep digging into like videos and stuff but luckily like, this this thing was really popular like you can find it at air shows and like people really really like to get close to this thing so i spent several hours like every day like every, when i was working on this model i had uh part of my my browser or like uh, my video player just yeah. going just having like the video going around so yeah, i would yeah, yeah. you know yeah, it was, yeah, that was... yeah um so yeah just want to touch up on your like um your research process so um mm-hmm. obviously you try to get as much information as you could um yes do you maybe enjoy is the wrong word to use because it's like a fact-finding mission but like do you enjoy researching um like what is your thought process when you are going through things i mean i think i've got a general grasp because you just mentioned certain technical designs that you may find are not exactly accurate for what you need it for because they've been done like you mentioned for the layman just to kind of show yeah. something as opposed to be uh, an instruction mm-hmm. of some kind so do you find mm-hmm. yourself going in rabbit holes or um yes okay yeah uh speaking of rabbit holes like um because when you're digging up like information like every individual component had a you know, had a purpose. So I found myself Googling like uh, different terms, like, uh, like what this component was, like, what was the crankshaft? Like what, what, what do they do with the crankshaft and that kind of thing? Mm. And there were certain like, electric motors and like, um, they're, they're like even like little like circuit box looking things on the side yeah. uh, with the switch trying to limit how many bullets fly out of the gun and that kind of thing, which is, you know, it's not really that common on, uh, most of the stuff that uh, I've looked at before, like even yeah. with the machine gun stuff, like it's not like a complete switch. Like, well, maybe it is. Like, it's built into the safety for some of the guns because I I did look at some of um, regular guns before. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to this giant, like uh, this giant weapon that goes inside, like all the fighter jets and stuff, like I, I found it a bit strange that they would separate the the sort of box uh, and keep it with the gun instead of you know um, keeping it inside with the cockpit or something. Because I really didn't know how this this thing was like uh, supposed to work when you and use it have you have you always been like that in terms of um gathering research like i guess not just for much art but i guess you know other tasks in life in general maybe perhaps in school um have mm. you always been this way or is that something that 
um has came uh, has come to you later on um whilst becoming an artist or is this like like is this a reflection of your personality well i ran uh it's funny that you mentioned that because like uh again coming back to this like uh this uh, m61 study when i was looking at all the references and like um when i'm looking back at some of the work that i did concurrently right mm -hmm. I, I i think i've asked this question to myself when i was doing this like study a few times like there's no way I would do this like for um, anything else. It, it was a strange feeling because this thing is so mind-bogglingly weird and like it's difficult just to dig up information, like being thorough with the uh, research, right? It's not something that I normally do because uh, it, it, I only did it out of necessity, I guess. Because uh, I see. the fact of the matter is, if I could get away with not looking, uh, with if I could get away with uh, doing less, I probably would. You know what I mean? Like, um, th there's no need to really um, uh, overindulge in the uh, the research process if you don't have to, like, because some of the information, like, it may not be relevant to your final product. So, yeah. uh, I I sort of over overdid it in some places, but I think it ultimately was all necessary because they all sort of fed back into the um, the final product. Sorry. So yeah, um, in in some aspects of my work, like. If I have a decent grasp of it, or I feel like it, it I, I won't really gain anything from looking into it too far because uh, if you go too far and like, in the end it doesn't pay off, mm. like the, you've kind of wasted your time, so to speak. You know what I mean? Have you so experienced I, I kinda, that much? Yeah, it's kind of our experience as well. Like, um, sometimes I, I used to have uh, a lot of like research to do it beforehand. Like if I wanted to approach like a, a scene drawing or something like that, right? Yeah. I would think of a lot of references and ultimately I didn't need them. So nowadays mm -hmm. I kind of, I kind of just take them as I need because t pulling stuff off the internet, like um, preemptively is, is not the best idea. Mm -hmm. I found, I, I found it through experience, I guess, because there's really no reason like um, to, to assume that everything is going to be needed because sometimes even, uh, even your uh, day to day, like uh, or hour to hour decision changes based on what you're drawing and that kind of thing, like your design will evolve and your references also need to evolve. So you need to keep up with mm. the, uh, the what, what do you call it, the, the final intent. I would say you need to find a way to approach your final design and your drawing or whatever it is that you're doing in order to achieve it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I've been down that rabbit hole many times as well, and yeah, I can totally relate. Rabbit. Like where I've over researched to the point where I've actually yeah. entered into the time to actually make the thing. And then when yeah. you come to make it, it's like, oh, okay. Well, I would say it's a waste of time for that particular project. But then obviously mm -hmm. at the same time, it's kind of like you've done that research. So it might help you in a future project. But I guess it's it's a balancing thing. Um, yeah, definitely a balancing thing. Obviously, a nice segue uh, into balance. Um, you mentioned that things are a bit quiet right now, obviously because of uh, coronavirus. Um yeah. You're from uh, Malaysia, of course. Yes, I am um, still here. So, how has the the virus affected you um, as an art professional? In fact, before we get to that, um, mm -hmm. like, so, are you? How long have you been a are you full time um, freelance artist? Yeah, essentially, I'm a full time freelancer. Um, been doing it for about maybe since the end of 2016. Like, uh, I think I got my first like. Uh, maybe 2016 around that time yeah mm -hmm. and up Something until um where did when did coronavirus hit you guys because i think for us over here it was pretty mm -hmm. much where things came to a standstill um oh. end of end of march like and when they said okay stop this but we're not doing this anymore um etc cetera, etc cetera, where obviously it really mm -hmm. affected businesses economies people's ability to earn um, so our time frame over here was about end of March. I think a lot of countries also as well. What was the time frame? I would say the same thing for Malaysia too, because our country started restricting like a uh, movement. We have the so-called movement restrict. Uh, sorry, uh, movement control order. Mm -hmm. So that that happened at the end of March as well. Okay, uh, okay. Right before, yeah, right before the last week. So I would say it's around the same time as the UK. And what was work like for you um, or your schedule? up until that point like up until march was it on a um, decline or was it like almost yeah, right. an abrupt decline it wasn't an abrupt decline because mm -hmm. like um 
like most people, I think like uh, the clients that I had, like they were still like con- going to continue at home. Mm. Uh, they, they still had, they still had something to achieve like uh, with their projects and stuff. So they definitely like managed to get some stuff in. Yeah. But it's only like now, like uh, only after like maybe a few funds run down. Or then like um, some of the newer prospective clients, like um, they find that they can afford uh, the services and stuff. So yeah. They, yeah, it's definitely affecting people like way after the fact because like uh, the funds do run out because it, it didn't hit them like a hammer or anything right. like that. It's uh, more it's more of a deceleration of um, the projects uh, as they come along. So definitely yeah. things are quieting down in that sense. Yeah, I'm in, not getting any in like In terms of yet. your clients are like, what kind of industries do you work for? Like, are they mainly entertainment industries or is it like quite a diverse variety? Hmm. Um. It used to be more diverse, but um. Okay. Uh. I'm just gonna list down some of the industries that. Oh. Okay. Sure. Uh. It's more like I've I've done some work for like uh science fiction card games. Like there was one mm-hmm. game that was started a few years ago. It was like Traveler, the Traveler collectible card game. Um. Okay. That one was uh. I, I guess it's still. Yeah. I, I would still consider that one to be a, a tabletop game. Yeah. There's a physical yeah. tabletop game. Yeah. You get print cards and stuff. Uh, there was one music cover, uh, at the very least, like, I think that was the only music cover that I ever did. That was mm-hmm. the, uh, the special one, I guess. Most of the stuff I do is for, like, um, independent games, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, no films yet, I, I think, uh, as far as I recall. So, it's still, Some but there aren't it's still that many, mainly uh, entertainment design, right? Yeah, I would say they're mostly entertainment design. That's quite interesting, because, and I think you mentioned that these are, like, um, companies that are about to start a project and obviously they're not able yeah. to now. um because speaking to like well listen to, to mache on his podcast and on my last one with patrick o'keefe okay i remember, I remember asking him because obviously he's worked on spider verse so you know hollywood films the hollywood industry yeah, yeah. and asked him like what's the the mood like like in terms of their like is there worry are the people saying that okay guys you know it works in a slow down um but he said that it's almost the opposite it's like probably going to be busier now or um there is no Ooh. worry like we're still going to have work um but um so it, it does appear that i guess projects that are happening or have already been green lit um yeah will will continue Those, yeah, train keeps um, going for the- but yeah like obviously you mentioned like some some of the other clients or like other industries maybe like even indies or ones where Hmm. they're about to begin um yeah they may either not happen or they might not happen at that that the time that they expected so it might happen later on um yeah so it's it's a weird one it's like maybe the 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 bigger fish will be okay but the the Hmm. smaller fish might not be um yeah so I, I was saying um, it's the same for like most of the uh, the retail industries as well. Like uh, just about every industry across the board, like due to yeah. the virus, like all the companies they have um, they have deeper like reserves of money and stuff. Mm-hmm. So they'll be able to hang on tighter. Like all the smaller businesses, like even with the uh, even with like local government loans and stuff, they're really feeling the pinch. So if they don't get back to work Dude, somehow, they're not gonna get any new it's, cash flow. It's something that like I I I personally um worried to see and also mm. sad to think that it probably will happen because there are some industries that with this situation it's going to absolutely cripple them um yeah i mean it, i think I mean, most countries yeah. everywhere have like given some kind of handout or stimulus packages to certain industries to make yeah. sure that they can stay afloat or mainly i think it's more to more for them to not lay off their employees because yeah Otherwise, they'd have mass mass amounts of unemployed people, which is bad for any kind of economy. Um, yeah. However, there's yeah. just the way we're hearing now, like how people will have to conduct themselves in public, and um, the habits of like having to, let's say, take retail for example, having to shop and whatnot. Mm. Um, over here, the store is saying things like about social distancing, like two meters and face masks and what have you. Some places yeah. you can only have a certain amount of number of people inside, so let's say your mm. business before was about getting as many people in the door as possible, turning over as much cash as quickly as possible, and then move on to the next thing. That's clearly going to slow down now. So it's a yeah. shame where like in the space of, I think six months or whatever, as soon as the virus um, 
literally yeah, starting to it. break out. Um, it's going to take years, I think, for it to actually kind of get back to normal where as they were before. Um, and there are yeah. some industries that are, as a result, will directly feel not only a pinch, but almost like they can't exist anymore as a result of this. So on one hand, it's like... Yeah entertainment industry is is great and i think most people listening to this are trying to get into that field so it's encouraging to hear yeah. that um these so companies worry, yeah are still looking to do projects which means there's chances for work um which may also mean that there will be other types of um companies or entities that want to get into this field as well because it's still making money so they probably would realign yes. to that so that means more work but then at the same mm. time, there's like, I think there's a bunch of us out there, like myself included, where it's, mm -hmm. we're trying to get art to be our full-time thing. But then we've also got other jobs which are not art and they might be directly affected by this. So it's, it, it it's a weird one, but. um, Yeah, it's, it's trying for everybody. What, um what's your take on it? Like, how do you feel about the future in terms of, um as a as a freelance artist not only um, are you mainly your clients like worldwide or um are yeah, they, they, from Malaysia? Worldwide, yeah. I, I certainly don't have any local clients uh okay cool so yeah, yeah um so as a, as a freelance artist like what's your take on the situation um i'm really glad to be doing freelancing to be honest like uh, i i like for years like i've been on the fact that i couldn't get like uh and i in fact it's probably still difficult for me to get like a full-time job Mm. like uh, in over studios or even one of the local like malaysian studios right so mm -hmm. that, that that's t totally true by the way um but now like with all this thing uh with all these like viruses going around like um the coronavirus mm -hmm. keeping everybody at home like i'm perfectly happy to continue freelancing because that's uh, what everybody's been forced to do anyway mm. um and you know uh working from home if you've got all the correct setups like with no distractions it's, it's going to be very comfortable and stuff you don't have to commute and all that, that kind of thing. Like, um, mm -hmm. you'll be in charge of your schedule for the most part. Um, it's mostly about like, uh, self discipline, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think a lot of freelancers as well, um, have mm -hmm. been vocal about saying that they haven't really felt much of like, I guess, a difference in terms of how they're working before, yeah. especially working that, from home because it's like, yo, this is what we do every day. Um, but how mm has -hmm. it been like not being able to go out? Has that affected you much or again has it been like business as usual before because again probably focusing on work uh to be perfectly honest like uh, i don't go out all that often uh mm -hmm. i i go out for like the necessities and stuff like uh certain social events mm -hmm. and now all that like the social events are basically cancelled out mm -hmm. even though like some of the uh, the hawker stores and restaurants like uh have opened up to this business and stuff okay um i'm not taking the risk to, to eat outside yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, I would bless those people for like trying though. Like, uh, I still do takeouts and that kind of thing to yeah, support yeah, yeah. them. Yeah, that's the that's the very least I can do. Um, yeah, but true, yeah, true. Um, as far as going out goes, like, um, uh, I it, it probably like it it probably kills some people on the inside to not be able to go out. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I I think I did mention this to you before. Like, um, yeah, they recorded again and stuff. Um, you know, those people probably won't be able to handle it. Uh, mm -hmm. because this is completely new to them. Like, they're used to being outside and they're very gregarious and stuff for me yes. I'm, I'm pretty much a shut in i guess yeah it, it's yeah. probably the it's probably like um a result of my job or you know maybe it was uh maybe i chose this like a freelancing thing because um it, it was more comfortable for me to do so i guess yeah mm -hmm. not that i'm against going out that kind of thing i obviously i do because like uh i do travel around if i can um mm -hmm. with family the make friends that kind of yeah. thing like go over that kind of thing but certainly like with this year, not a chance. Not a yeah, chance. For sure. I mean, yeah. it's weird how like it's six months have passed and half the year's literally finished. But it's yeah, almost I, like... Yeah, it's just half a year gone. Like I'm still thinking it's uh, what, April and stuff? Not the case yeah. anymore. Yeah. So how much like, time is already passed? It's like, um, for me, it feels like it's just been on pause and I'm waiting to resume. And like um, my mind is still at the beginning of the year um, because yeah. it was like, um, you know, okay, let's we've got this, this, this and this to do. But it's almost like yeah, years past and, uh, of 2020, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's going to be awesome. 2020 is going to, it's definitely made its mark in history for sure. Um, yeah, it's only it's been like, six months. Like, Who knows what the next six months will hold? Um, but we will look back at this time and 
have many stories to tell our children and grandchildren about this time. Yeah. Um, but so like, uh, on, the, on, the, on the flip side, um, yeah. we do have SpaceX like getting things done, like seriously. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah, I'm really thinking like the, the SpaceX stuff, like, um, yeah. Yeah. Are you into are you into like space and stuff like that generally? Obviously, as someone who, um, I mean, are you big into like engineering? Would you say? Because looking at your work, I would say you are. And obviously, you mentioned about your research. Is that something you have? Yeah, like... I, I that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, because I guess SpaceX is almost like a natural thing yeah. to be excited about, right? For yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, because with the decline of the like, uh, the NASA like uh, locally based um, space shuttle program, like. Mm. Every other company like uh, has had to pick up the slack, I guess, like presenting their alternatives, and it's really neat to see all these like uh, private companies or like semi-private companies pick up the uh, designs, and we're seeing all sorts of new things. Because for the longest time, like when I was growing up, everything that I had to do with space travel, like uh, it was all like NASA, right? Like just yeah, space shuttles and yeah, like this. Yeah, the rest. which is it's still did, like weird like, to think. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm the same. Like, when it comes to space and all that kind of stuff, like, I've been geeking out and nerding out about that since since a little bit. <laughs> like, it's been awesome. And it's weird to think, like, the things, like, like even the space shuttle, even though I don't remember how, when it was made, it was made a fair bit of time ago, it still feels like yeah. something that looks new and looks like space age, even though it's clearly older than, like, I think, both of us. Um, yeah, it is. And, in both of us yeah and even like the aesthetic world. of like space travel um that was done back in like the the 60s and what have you so it, it's weird how yeah. like you know all this time has passed like 50 years on and that still mm. looks and, and feels fresh but then obviously you look at what spacex are doing and it does look um a lot more i guess you could say modern um but the key thing is yeah. it, it all works so it, it's a cool thing um also just like a little bit of a bit of a side side note is mm -hmm. you mentioned about obviously before what we used to see was what NASA are doing. I know you got like a few other agencies now that are, you know, racing to the moon and what have you and all these experiments, which is cool. Competition yeah. is great. Um, before it literally was just NASA and Russia doing their thing, um, sending people mm. into space, what have you. And in terms of what, what we used to watch as growing up in, in the UK and like as kids and on films and stuff, it was pretty much just NASA. Um, sure was, think, yeah. And... I guess for whatever reason, I don't know the full reasons behind it, but I'm pretty sure it's like economical and all these political mm -hmm. things behind it that have meant that they can't do these things they used to do before, or maybe the energy mm -hmm. wasn't there like it used to be before. Um, it's interesting to see with SpaceX do what they've done um, with this to show that um, in collaboration with like say NASA or like having the energy to do new things and I guess the competition of having other competitors beat them to it can show yeah. that their other solutions can be made, um, groundbreaking solutions and they can be done in maybe a much better time frame. Um and even with like other issues in the world what are happening right now and what have happened for a very long time, it almost says that if you apply that same energy and that same logic and that same philosophy to those things, um those things could be progressed at the same way that space travel could be as well. Um, but yeah, um, back to like say SpaceX and stuff. Like, did you did you watch the launch? Did you did you watch uh, it live? Were you I able to? It must have been super late I didn't on your end. Basically, trolled everyone and like uh, got cancelled. Like, uh, I tuned into the second one because the first. I don't know what I was doing during the uh, the first launch. Like, I think I was actually busy doing something, and then like right. it turned out that the first launch was a uh, was a bust. Mm. luckily it wasn't like a catastrophic like failure or some crap um I it was just you know bad weather, weather got... yeah it was just bad weather like luckily it'll be but, the, but the image looked cool you just had this this uh rocket uh and then you had like this gray cloud behind it, it looked like concept art to be fair yeah th th that's that's the fun thing like um it's not like it's not like concept anymore <laughs> it literally flew to space and back <laughs> yeah it's true it's so true <laughs> and that's the thing about all this like um it's not like a movie. It's not like a. It's not a presentation. It, it mm. actually happens. So this is what that that was what really got me the other day. It's like, man, this is uh, it's actually happening, and it it came back. Uh, yeah. All working, it should, which is perfect. Like, which means the next thing will be even greater again. Yes, very yeah. true. Very true. Um, who knows? In our lifetime, maybe we'll be be able to buy tickets that are affordable and just blast off into space for a bit, and then then and then come back down. Um. 
yeah. So like during this this whole lockdown, um, are you guys like are they saying to kind of like are they starting to calm things down now, or is it still pretty much hardcore lockdown? Well, uh, we certainly started to relax some things, especially with um, well, our prime minister. Like I, I think he started to announce that there's going to be some kind of relaxation of some measures. Hmm. Um, stuff like barber shops and spas might open this week. Um, okay. I'm, I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. I'm sure they figured some some clever like um, some clever procedures to get everybody like uh, clean and that kind of thing, which I can definitely appreciate. I I would say that just about everyone needs some kind of haircut at this point. Dude, it's been a I've, long while. Uh, yeah, man, <laughs> I've got some insane level of growth going on. I, I think it's a yeah. record for me, but um, I can't wait. Everybody's to go my haircut. got mullet now. <laughs> but I think I'll break the clippers when they start to cut it. So you know, I'm have to pay for yeah. it and pay for them. Um. So in in the time that you've had, obviously, like being at home, um, lockdown, mm-hmm. you mentioned that um, it's been a decline in terms of uh, client work. What have you been yeah. doing in that time? I know you mentioned like three D printing and working on personal projects. Have you done anything yeah. deliberately to like um, build anything up? Have you taken any like classes or worked on certain skills in that time? Um, or have you? Oh, sorry. Uh, have you like looked at that time to be like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna like slow down a little bit and relax a little bit as well. Um, yes and no, I guess, uh, it seems that, well, I'm looking at my table now and like, uh, I'm surrounded by some of the, uh, the scale models and like, uh, war gaming miniatures that I've done over the last few months mm-hmm. because with the relaxation of some of the, uh, uh, the work schedule, right. I, I've had time to, to sort of go back to a hobby, which ties into what I'm 3D printing, I guess, because, um, I sort of lost touch with, um, the way that I paint miniatures because you do have to paint these when they, um, when they're bought in the box. Mm. They come out as like grey lumps of like plastic or like uh you know, the shiny pieces of metal, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I do these, like uh I have to assemble them, that kind of thing, like uh and you convert them to do different poses because out of the box, they only have one pose in some cases. So you can mm. you can change them as you like. Um I haven't picked up any new software beyond Blender, but that was last year, I think. I'm thinking about picking up Unreal, but I, I I'm I'm still debating whether I should wait until like Unreal Five. But then again, I don't even know when Unreal Five is coming along. Yeah, so true. it might be a good idea. Now, yeah, like, yeah. is it gonna be able for anyone to use straight away, or is it gonna be like for, you know, because that was done for the PlayStation Five demo, right? Yeah, that was just a demo. Um, I don't. So did they have exclusivity on it or whatnot? Available. But yeah, that that does look amazing. Um, yeah, Unreal right. Five does. But I guess you know it's worthwhile. I mean, that's something on my list as well. Um, Blender. I did mm. I think last time we spoke. I started to do stuff then, but then I just haven't touched it afterwards um but oh, it's yeah. trying to have a lot of features that i use in Maya at the moment so i've got to i'm definitely want to give it some time to mm. um you know i, I just want to switch away from Maya and use something that's like <laughs> free which which makes sense yeah. economically but um it just looks like it'll be blender looks cool man it's like blender you got eevee cool, uh, you got yeah. all these cool things you can do all these you got box cutter, you got um quick draw, all that kind of stuff in there. Um it just mm. like something fun to play with. And if you can make cool art out of it, e- even even better. Um Yeah. I did do I... some sculpting with Blender actually. Like uh yeah, maybe uh because some of this will maybe edit and post, like uh, I might send you the picture of what I uh yeah, of, totally, of one of the totally. which, uh which I sort of like uh, push further in Blender again. Because this this is the thing about the the current scale of like three D printing, right? Uh, in order to get some of the models like some people like they they don't know how to model but they they do have the capability to print still right mm. so what happens is um you go on a place called thingiverse like um some of these models like they're offered for free because these were created by other users and it's offered uh free of charge right mm. and then you can take these models and like you can alter them to suit your needs or whatever or you can make like some proportional changes if it's a figure and that kind of thing which is what i did mm. um and yeah, I can, I can, I can show you that after like, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, after the uh, podcast, that kind of thing. But yeah, anyway. Um, and why, was why a, Unity? Would you say uh, Unreal? Sorry, why, why would, why do you want to get into that? I, I guess oh, yeah, it's pretty uh, obvious because of the results yeah. that other people are doing. But just to get your perspective on it. Yeah, the, uh, because from what I've heard, like, well, from what I've seen anyway, uh, mm. during the production of stuff like The Mandalorian, when they were mm. projecting uh, background to do the filming, they didn't need like a green screen anymore. They just projected like this huge panorama of um, yeah. 
some environment like uh, well, it was pretty simple, I guess. Like I, I didn't, I, I kind of figured they did it on location, but it's easy to control when you're inside of a studio with a giant projector behind you, right? So it gives you a lot of level control, and I think, I think if you're a production or concept artist, like if you if you have that kind of access to the technology, like there'll be fewer middlemen for the studios to hire, and they can just call you directly. Maybe you can assume more responsibilities in that sense. So correspondingly, like I, I kind of hope that you know that the wages would uh would also like uh increase because of your uh because of your um additional like responsibilities and like capabilities like yeah you get to solve more problems on set instead of, like just drawing the stuff like you can actually like affect what appears on the plate or thing mm. that might be fun yeah like um it is like do you think the the role of a concept artist is heading that way where you kind of almost like have to not only because i mean to be fair it was like solving problems visually like whether it's a design or a prop or a set or a scene um almost with the tools now you can kind of do that in in a scene is it do you think that's where the industry is heading or the way the role of a concept artist is heading yeah because like concept artists like when we draw stuff, like I, I, like I, I'm sure you'll agree. Like, uh, what you see is what you get, sort of thing. Like, uh, mm-hmm. even when you suggest things, like whatever idea that you propose, usually makes it. Uh, oh, sorry. Like, uh, whatever idea you have, like, it's it's definitely going to be present in your final drawing, like, uh, or whatever picture that you present. Um, when you show when you show people something, it was your idea. Like, it was no accident. Like, you designed it and you put mm-hmm. it there. So the same logic might probably apply with the tools uh, when you have stuff like Blender, like rendering in EV, like that's real time. Yep. Any other yep. game engine like Unity or Unreal, that's also real time. So mm-hmm. it's very much, a, I, I, kind of, I kind of see the industry going like, what you see is what you get sort of root. Yeah. You don't have to wait too long for renders, that kind of thing. Like, not that renders take that long these days anyway. Like uh, they're all like lightning fast and they're getting quicker all the mm-hmm. time. So the next step is to do everything like in real time. I mean, it's been, it's, been, like, uh, it's been coming things. for a while to be fair like let's say yeah, e- even yeah. before mandalorian um there were things films like oblivion which used um like it had projectors so it projected the actual oh, yeah, right. environment onto the the actors so you had the reflections all perfect and i believe also in gravity as well they had like um i guess like a triplane a map type situation but um it was like the actual scene of space or what have you. Um, so it looked more accurate. But even like, say, you look at um, Avatar, where the way James Cameron filmed it, where he was filming it in VR and moving around, like he had the set kind of pre-built and he could move around in it. I guess it's kind of the same thing, but obviously back then it would have been specific to that. Whereas now that would be considered like um, too expensive to do, but it's kind of the same thing, I guess, where you can just have yeah. your scene, find your shot, lock it down and do it then and maybe even back yeah. to before where like when george lucas was making the prequel trilogies and he was really pushing uh digital filmmaking techniques just to get the cgi better um i guess with yeah. like a green screen it's almost like kind of gone full circle so um yeah you know it, it's interesting how it's all kind of converging and maybe um who knows in 10 years time the role of a concept artist might be called something else yeah, like um, we we might even get folded into like the production. Like we we won't just be part of pre-production anymore because like um, as it stands, maybe people like uh people who work at waiter like I as far as I can tell, sometimes they are roped onto the sets or something. Like uh, mm-hmm. they help out with the, like Peter Jackson calls them around, mm-hmm. and like uh, they all solve stuff together. But I'm I'm not too sure about that. So don't quote me on that. Uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I can kind of see like a uh, concept artist might get a more involved role in the final production, especially now with like uh, again with the uh with the uh, evolution of what you see is what you get sort of tools. Yes. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, because it's quite all about like, uh, the fewer steps you have in between, like the less, e- even with like, um, how should I say this? The, f- the few people you have to call in, like the better, I guess. So that yeah, if you can get the stuff locked down, the less post work you have to do, like the better everything will go. Like it's going to be a boon for like giant productions and like mm. uh, independent filmmakers, I guess. Yeah, I guess like if you, if you are a filmmaker um, or even a film studio and you want to make something and you, you know, I'm sure like I remember somehow looking into like um, a film budget and um, someone had leaked a few and you could just see like how many different pieces and how many different things were involved in it. And even if you're trying yeah, to look at like the, 
in. the end the end credits of a film like it's 10 minutes long on a feature length film and yeah. that's all the people involved so if it can on that aspect of filmmaking save money you can see those studios invest a lot of time and money into that to save themselves money um yeah which is scary on one hand because some people be like yo i don't have a, have a job anymore because exactly, this yeah. thing has there's taken a, there's it. a real technical side of this whole thing as well like mm-hmm. um because the, the fact of the matter is like with easier tools or uh with a so-called streamlined process if the studios can get away of getting like a uh, fewer people on what to save money and stuff they'll totally do it like you know they will totally, yeah. yeah i mean there will yeah, be a few makes, people who'd be like yeah. i'm only going to make it this way like say you know, you look. You look at um people like Christopher Nolan, who mm-hmm. still uses CGI. Um, even even David Fincher's CGI as well, but particularly Christopher Nolan will use CGI. But he's big on practical effects. He's big on um using film as opposed to digital film. So they will have certain people yeah. who would demand, like I want it this way, but they're going to be few and far between. Um, yeah. because you can't really tell Christopher it's Nolan what to do. It's the other way around. But there will be. I guess other filmmakers who maybe want that same vision, but then they don't mm. have that clout or respect, and then studios would be like, "Yeah, that's great, but we were going to do it this way to save money." But then on the positive side, like say as concept artists like ourselves, it's yeah. something cool to learn because you know it's. I personally think it's fulfilling seeing something that you've built, and you can kind of move around it, and yeah, it's it's also from a creative sense satisfying knowing that okay, that thing I put there is because I needed it there because it made sense to be put there. Um, mm. it, it's, it's pretty neat in that regard. Um, also, like you mentioned as well, it is it is more efficient and better when there's fewer pieces in something because it's it's more pure. Yeah. It may, the message gets through to the right people in a better way. It's more direct. Um, so that might mean um, the quality of the final product is better. Um, for example, like some TV shows that I watch, um, mm-hmm. I, I am quite of a, I do kind of get happy and I do get excited when I see that there's one director on every single episode or maybe, oh, nice. you know, like the, the DOP is the same on every episode. So like, for example, the f- season one of true detective, I don't know if you've seen that, um, yeah, that pretty I much did, had the, the same writer and the same director on every single episode. And for me. Um, it was a success because it just showed like visually from beginning to end each episode just made sense because there was just that small knit team so i guess like on a on this kind of topic we're talking about like say concept yeah it's all about the in that case yeah maintaining the vision like opening your design choices that kind of stuff yeah Mm -hmm. yeah like you can imagine like there will be some i mean i guess mache to be fair um Mm -hmm. with rupert sanders on um ghost in the show it was almost like him and the director and there was just that direct line between them so you can imagine oh, really? like oh, if yeah, there yeah. were like yeah. three four people in between um maybe the results visually would not be as as, as good um because mm-hmm. you know the director's voice is changing because it passed through somebody else and then somebody else and, and what have you but then you can also probably see that um maybe we'd have films or like pieces of art or games or what have you where literally it could be like the director plus a small team that would help build you know like in unity or whatever uh, more unreal mm-hmm. um to build the set to build the scene and uh, and it's gonna be interesting to see what kind of artwork comes out of that as well um also yeah um, not, not even that like let's say that might mean there's less work going around because you know there's there's more and i think that's the case now there's more artists than there are jobs but then I would it, say does, so. it does give you something to think about. Like, so, so how do I make money or how do I, you know, earn a living if there's no work? Well, then you can also use this to your advantage and make your own thing. Yeah, I was just about to say that as well. Like um, with, with the events of all these tools, like every like the final product is going to be easier to achieve. You don't you want to have to pass it along to say. Uh, you want to have to pass it along to like a, a render farm or like a production studio to do this mm-hmm. kind of thing. You can totally do it on your own computer. Like the guy who made a study is that kind of thing. Yeah. That would be exactly. impossible. Yeah, great like, example. Two years ago, like uh, there are a few like Warhammer, like 40,000 like um, mm. productions, uh, which are fan-made by the way, uh, out there. And they they easily rival like other, what you call it? Other like full, fully-fledged like production. Mm-hmm. 
of like Wave Under Studios, that kind of thing. They they're easily the match, I guess. Yeah. Which is really astounding, but um, you know, we shouldn't be too surprised because these tools are out there, and um, that's very you know true. the people working on these just one guy, and they're like complete professionals, I guess. Like they're they're masters of the craft, shall we say? Yeah, hundred percent. It's like even like Ian yeah. Hubert. Um, I'm sure you've seen his stuff with his. Oh yeah, um, yeah. You told me he did right. Uh, that and thing it's like you just LA. think, oh. yeah, you just think, okay, cool. Super and it's like, oh, it's all blender. Oh, it's all EV. And it's like, wow. Um, but he he knows his tools and he knows what he's doing, and the results are amazing. And it's it's also refreshing yeah. to see that it's like it's just his voice. It's not his voice through something else or through a studio. It's just he's independent, basically. That's great. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, um, and it's been up, like programs and stuff. Like um, after picking up like uh, a few different programs, even picking up Blender and stuff, or, or like learning Maya and like 3ds Max back in the day, I would just like to point out that you know whatever tools you, whatever ideas or like story you want to tell. Doesn't matter what tools you want. Um, if the tools you already have um, can suit you and you can get the job done, just stick with it. It doesn't matter. Like, there's always gonna be a new toy to play with. Like, um, yeah, man. When I started learning concept art, like, uh, what, what do you call it, F FZD back in the day, like, Modo was kind of on the uptake. Uh, mm -hmm. Modo, C uh, Cinema 4D, SketchUp, that kind of thing. And now yeah. they just, you know, they just kind of there. Then the new hotness is Unreal and Blender. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, and it's. Yeah, they, it's interesting to see that it's it's free, those two. I mean, I remember like yeah. in university and looking at free software and like thinking, okay, that's cool. Oh, I'd love to learn that. And then you look at the price of it and thinking, oh my gosh, that's what, three grand? That's four grand? Yeah. Uh, you know, like you almost like, yeah, uh, you almost like six to one. And I guess the reason that they had the prices for a reason um, and the industries they were serving uh, meant that that was a, obviously a price that, that those industries could afford. Yeah, but it's almost like change now. It's almost like everything's either free to use or like a subscription model, um, or yeah. like I think Unreal situation. I think Unity is the same thing as well. Is a case of yeah, you yes, can yeah. use it for free, um, but when you start making money off it, um, we're gonna take a cut, which I think is is fair, um, because it also it's also a good advertisement for that particular product as well, because you're basically saying, you talented people use our tool um make awesome stuff and at the same time they can promote their product to show what awesome stuff can be made um and yeah. i think you can see like with the fact that now those kind of services are being picked up by big productions you know the ones with huge budgets um yeah maybe that, that was, was the end up, game yeah. maybe that was the end game all along it was a case of yeah we can make it awesome but then maybe can't you know muscle out these huge competitors that we we are up against um but if we do it free and slowly build it up that way and make it attractive to filmmakers um and other studios then we can get them that way and i mean i know like vaughn ling used blender on spider-verse um for some of his pieces right. and um i think some game studios now are using blender just because for whatever the i mean as concept artists it doesn't really matter um you can yeah, use anything to get the job done um and if it's free it's saving budgets and obviously like with the with the time now where everyone's working from home you've seen another way another way where companies can save money because you're not paying money on rent and the other overheads that it costs to keep a member of staff in a building you can just leave them at home. Yeah. um so and it's yeah, great that these tools are here all like, um, sorry for all, like, all these company yeah sorry i was about to interject later, like um yeah. With the uh, with the way things are, like remote work, like um, I really hope that companies don't exploit their workers and like saying, "Oh, you're doing this from home, you can just uh, you can do whatever." Like they'll, yeah. they'll just overwork them while they're supposed you to can, be stuck. You can this. see that happening. Change the at home instead. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, like I think a lot of people will be will be fine because as long as the yeah. work's getting done and the task's getting fulfilled. That's great. Mm. Um, but you can see some people really take advantage of it. And there will be some people who are just maybe starting out or are maybe not not good at, like, say, um, negotiating that situation where they can say, hold on, I'm, I'm, work I'm overworked. They'll just keep working. And some people yeah. would take advantage of that situation and be like, oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? There was something um, on the news today that... Uh, it was just it was just on in the background and I saw it and it's quite interesting because mm. in my in my other job uh, which is sales um, 
based when we yeah before we got told to not work at the moment before we got furloughed um, it was a case of working from home so we worked in store face to face with customers and then it switched yeah. to working from home which is very interesting because it was a complete change we completely new to all of us but then yeah naturally they could see exactly how long you were online all the interactions with the customers and what have you and the data was there Ooh, yeah. and for the most part it was fine because you know the management understood our managers are pretty sweet they understood that okay we don't expect you to be on it all this time to the point where they actually encouraged us to say you guys got to take a break like you can't be on this all the time um yeah and it was more oh, like yeah, a guide to see um they use the data as a guide to see where the improvements could be but then mm-hmm. you can see that another way around the news they were talking about this one person was saying that my colleagues would consider me very productive because in the office I was super productive I got loads of things done and I'd call myself super productive as well but then yeah. his data showed because they had a I don't know what they were using but they had um something that sh- that monitored his time on the at work or whatever software they were using and yeah they, they are probably like that yeah yeah and he got flagged up as someone who was considered not as productive but then fortunately for him his manager looked into it and was like well that doesn't make sense because we know how you work and then after yeah, they know into, yeah, after wrong. looking into his like daily schedule they thought okay that makes sense that's why that was the case because he had kids to look after and all that kind of stuff as well so you know he's using his time very well and it almost mm. went against him um and it, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a weird one where like <laughs> it, it's weird like it, at work because you're there you can kind of look like you're working but when you're not there, yeah. it's like they can see, depending on obviously where you, how you work, they can pretty much see just through data, like how are you working? And it's 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 a weird one. I've spoken to a few people as well who have said that working from home, they've never worked as hard because they're trying to, on one hand, just because they can, because they got, they're at home now, so they can have that extra energy to do that work. On the other yeah, hand, yeah. it's a case of... Um, I don't want to come across as someone who doesn't do good work. So I want to make sure that I don't get in the firing line. Um, oh, yeah. They're they saying so, like uh, just pay the hour somehow or something. Who knows? Mm-hmm. So so it is it is, it is a strange one. But I've always been an advocate of that for, for a long time. It's a case of it, where possible, not, not even just working from home, just like flexible working hours. So, yeah. you know, like... I don't know what it's like over there, but anyone who's work, who's worked in a busy place where you got rush hour, you know, traffic and trying to get to work at, on rush hour, where you got like trains mm-hmm. full to the brim and all that kind of stuff, it's just a nightmare sometimes. But if you staggered the day for some right. people, so you could like have people, okay, we got you know a bunch of people coming in at this time, and an hour's time we got another bunch of people, it just lightens the load and it spreads the load over the whole day as opposed to those certain moments. And, you know, th- there are some people who are better at working in the morning as opposed to in the evening or later on in the day and vice versa. So working from home, you can kind of like put people in their right places. And yeah, you can like uh, well. flex and optimize uh, the, 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 work, the work roster. Mm. But um, like yeah. we were talking about earlier about like working from home and how does it affect you, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, for myself... Um, I prefer to work from home as much as possible, but since yeah. the lockdown, it has affected me mentally, which I never, I was very surprised at because okay. I, I get like, even though I work in a customer facing environment, I have done for like over 10 years, I get social anxiety, oh. like in crowds. I just, I just get very weird, um, to the point where like okay. I've, I've got coping mecha- mechanisms and it's fine, but mm-hmm. it's, it appears that it will never go away. So you just, you just end up living with it. But then being at home, you thought, okay, that, that's where you want to be. You want to be like, you know, away from that situation. So, so it's nice and calm. But I don't know, man. It's just, it, it just feels weird, like, to be at home. And then when I do go out, um, you feel even more weird, like, coming across people. Like, I went to, you know, the, the shops to get some stuff or whatever. And it just, it was a very yeah. strange, anxiety-inducing experience. So... You know, um, I guess having that moment where you were outside with, with other people um, was good medicine, I guess you could say. Um, and, you know, even like meeting people face to face, 
will yeah. always be better than like you know where possible than than like say you know conference calling and stuff like even now obviously we were talking right now we have spoken <laughs> before this way it's not going to be easy for you know us two to meet up because of how far we are on the opposite sides of the world but you know i'm sure you'd agree that if it was face to face um it would be better but then who yeah, knows maybe uh, in like 20 years time or generations later on that's not going to be the case who knows yeah uh, because uh, there is there is this thing that i read from a, a michio kaku like article or book back in the day like um no matter how like good our communications technology will get like human beings will you know we we will prefer the uh the actual physical like interactions because of the so-called caveman principle like mm. at the core of our brain like, we're still kind of primitive in that way like um for better or worse we will prefer that kind of um physical interaction because it's more real it's tactile that kind of thing yes so i i, I think but you are staying with your family as well right um like Correct. you mentioned yeah. you are yeah. men so you yeah. you've definitely got family members to keep you occupied oh and, for like, sure yeah you know, definitely occupied at home yeah. especially with two kids um one of them having to yeah, homeschool you know. it's it's insane man <laughs> yeah um may, it, it's possible like um i i i I certainly wouldn't apply this to your case, but I I think I've read this like uh, online. Um, prolonged like uh, proximity to like the same people, like um, even if it is your family, like in some cases it it might have a detrimental effect. But I'm not saying that's uh, applicable uh, applicable in your case because um, it's kind of the reverse, I guess. Uh, mm. you do enjoy the company of others, that kind of. Um, no, there is something to that, and it is quite healthy, especially yeah. if it's like positive interactions. Um, to yeah, yeah, it has to be positive. Um, yeah. see as many people as possible um because it's just awesome and like even i mean that's one one cool thing about when i first discovered learn squared and stuff because i was like i i was averse to like being online and social media and what have you anyway just generally um i'd rather yeah. speak to my own you know, particular circle of friends um but then obviously joining learn squared and meeting artists yeah, and, uh, online yeah, essentially like a manager sort of thing yeah it's like um, meet, meeting people that way and sharing ideas and then even going to like uh, you know gatherings like industry workshops which I've been to whenever I can since like a couple of years ago um, just speaking to people who are like me in terms of like I don't know any other artists personally like you know especially mm. concept artists or even generally like I know a few people who are creative and into certain things and there's a lot of crossovers but um it, apart from like university when i was there i haven't really kept in touch with anybody from there like since that oh, time what? um it was refreshing just to be around people who are like-minded and have similar goals and are just into the same things which is weird because normally that's who your friends are anyway um mm. but it, it's different when i think it's healthy particularly with artists to be able to speak to other artists because there's a lot of things that artists get that other artists go through that you can't really you know explain to yeah. someone who's who's not uh, we encounter are not necessarily like applicable to other people which is really strange because like for us everything is pretty normal but there are some very minor things that only like uh artists or designers like think about especially if you work um for hours on end on your own like yeah ma'am. even before like virus like uh, as a freelancer like there are a lot of things that i never noticed like uh i didn't i didn't get too wigged out by being alone for us for hours or days on end mm. I mean, that's that's one one interesting thing about like having my family around me because they would be my gauge for that. Like, I would feel like yeah. I'm normal, so I'd be working away. Like, sometimes you do crazy hours, or like you'd work through the night, and then you think, okay, I got my task done, I can I can relax now. But then my wife would tell me yeah. that you know I I feel like I'm coming across like I'm a bit on edge, or you can she can clearly see that I'm I'm like overworked or burnt out um so it, it's interesting whereas like if i never had that gauge i'd probably think everything's fine so it, it is quite interesting what we do to yeah. ourselves as artists but then like you know to look on that like why why do you think i mean would you call yourself like an intense worker like what's because there's like different types of workers i guess like those that get stuff done but they like to have some time to chill out and and let off steam um and there's others that are just on it hardcore and quite relentless where do you fall on that spectrum um probably the first one like uh i i get stuff done but i i do tend my mind does do weird things like wander off or like um it, it sort of just forces me to stop like uh stop the work because mm. 
sometimes when you scrutinize a problem or like uh or you just sort of dig through like the, the tasks that you've set aside for yourself like they're, they're not like the giant like different projects or something like they're, they're more like steps to achieve the final like uh, design or something mm-hmm. sometimes that like uh my mind just sort of um sort of locks itself out of progressing on the uh the the the, the model or like the drawing the painting kind of stuff like i just have to step away that kind of thing mm. Um, it's very strange. Like um, in some ways, like my brain is inconsistent, which is, um, and it, it, again, this is uh, this is the nice thing about being freelance. Like um, you can, you can sort of like dictate for yourself like how long you need to take a break for, and like how long you can actually work for. Because there is like essentially like no overtime. Sometimes like you just keep going until like it's yeah, done, or you true. keep going. Until you're out of the, uh, so that the pro and con. But um, to answer your question, I would say. You know, when I'm on, I'm on, but uh, okay, maybe maybe not. Like I'm on, like I'm on full steam until I'm not, so to speak. Okay, it's like those no, guys who say, yeah, I'm right, except I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, now that, uh, that that makes sense, and <clears throat> I guess we all are on a certain way. Um, I guess it's just a case of how you manage it, and you um, do you have like tools you put in place, like how to manage yourself, like manage your time, um or manage your goals like obviously the the milestones about hitting deadlines etc like do you do you have any tips that maybe you'd like to share or things that have worked for you um in the past i would have advocated for like saying uh you set aside like some arbitrary time or like uh, a goal or well when i say arbitrary time it's like oh i gotta i gotta finish like this this thing or whatever by a certain time in the day and I found that to be like quite unrealistic for myself. Like this is speaking personally, right? I, I don't know if this works for other people because apparently it does. If you set like a, set aside like um, a deadline of uh, this sort of arbitrary timeline for yourself, some people can get things done, some people can't, like myself. Mm-hmm. But I can't do that. Like it needs to be an actual fire under my uh, under my chair to get things going because like if there's no hard deadline, like I'll probably like th- there might be less optimized ways for me to do it, but the final result is better, so to speak. Like. Um, mm. It, like again it could be like an overindulgence of research or like uh, i'm spending too much time rendering a certain thing like over modeling yeah. some detail that kind of thing you know like it, it may not necessarily like uh give you a better result at the end but it does help it and um it may or may not add value which is you know uh it's a hit and miss sort of thing unfortunately mm-hmm. so back to your question uh, back to the answer of that question like just just mind what you're doing, you know. Like even if you do have a set plan in place, like don't be too inflexible, because mm-hmm. sometimes like the client can change, or if you encounter a problem and you know the the previous solution will just crash and burn. So just be on your feet, like just think of something else. Like you're not a robot, you know. You can think of a better way of doing things. <laughs> sometimes there are quicker, like less painful ways of uh, approaching a problem. You'll thank yourself for it, you know. Yeah. Just I because you can do something that you have to do it, you know, like, oh, I, I know this program and I can get like the best detail, etc. Or yeah. I can just like, uh, or I can just like download Omega scans or I can get a pre-made model. I don't have to do it myself. I can just pay someone else to do it, like, so to speak, like if it's a, a lower budget model or like maybe it's a free item, a kit mesh sort of thing, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what what so, I mean to do is really like just adapt to the situation. Yeah, like problem solve and not if, I, and identify the problem first and foremost right um yeah I, I think like it's important as well that you mention to not be so inflexible i think that's super important yeah. like i'm probably more on the other end maybe i'm a bit too flexible sometimes so that <laughs> would, that would end up me working like super late or stretching myself um whereas if i added yeah. a bit more you know rigidity that means that like, this is getting done at this particular time and it just mm. you know makes space for other things but you know, I guess um, it is important to be a bit, give, have, a bit have a bit of leeway. So it, like you said, if you've got a deadline or you're giving yourself a self-imposed deadline, but you hit it, but then you look at your work and think that, uh, you know, it's not that great, but I've done my deadline, so I'm moving on. Maybe spend yeah, an extra like that day or so to be like, I'm going to improve it and make it the best it can be. Um, that mm-hmm. is probably a better approach. Um, but yeah. like me personally, like deadlines have been the bane of my existence. Ever since school, yeah, they have I've, been a very existence, mate. <laughs> um, I mean, like I've 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 struggled with them. Like some of my best work has never come out because I've I've failed to plan my project to hit the deadline. 
like you know just mm. get get absorbed in the ideation phase or what have you but yeah, yeah over time it's now become my perhaps my i hate to admit it but it's probably my my greatest ally is the deadline because it means i get stuff done like a few years ago yeah. i just managed to i think when i did the i don't know if you remember when i did the every days um just doing those mm -hmm. meant that i had to hit a deadline and that forced me to hit deadlines that isn't like get stuff done and not be so precious about the work um which has lasted that's one key takeaway from doing that particular challenge because the deadline means i've got that parameter knowing that this is when it's get done by and i get it done but at the same time i hate the deadline because i'd love to spend forever on something to make it the, the best it can be um but i guess that's a, that's, a, that's a myth for everybody like i would definitely say now that deadlines are probably the thing that make let's say you see a great project the deadline made that project great because otherwise it would never have ended and you yeah some, the light of day yeah. it's like, because, like um you mentioned uh, like the deadlines uh sorry and going back to like no, the, the yeah. arbitrary like uh, times that you set for yourself when i was working on like the the art station like block low, low robot like i was doing like the legs and stuff mm -hmm. i just said like okay i need to be done by this amount of time mm. Uh, no matter the cost and you know when i did like put the picture up there was an earlier version of the leg that i did yeah and it didn't look so good to me like i felt like there were some changes that i could do like and i said uh, well i i mean i i got the picture up like there was a so-called deadline that i did like because sometimes i do like have a arbitrary deadline for myself anyway yeah. just so that i can move on to the next thing and i said why did i do that like you know i i really did question the uh the, the wisdom of having an arbitrary deadline in that case mm -hmm. especially if it's a personal project if it's not if you if you haven't gone like too far like self-indulging like taking too much time on that one thing it's fine to just spend a little bit more time because you know it's going to be better if you do like there's True. no reason like you have to ask yourself why like uh, again like coming back to like uh being flexible with um with what you're doing and paying attention like if it needs more attention you just pay it more attention like there's no use like cutting yourself off right now because um you know most artists like we're, we got like some ocd like sort of uh we just have to come back and uh, do it right. You know, yeah. you can just leave it as it is. I think there's like, as creatives, there's that feeling like, you know, when something's not done, you know, when something doesn't feel right, you know, when something isn't the yeah. idea that okay. you had imagined oh. it. So you're like, i got to mm. get this idea out and I don't know what it is, but I spend X amount of time doing it. Um, but then yeah. I guess like one pro to um, having that arbitrary deadline you just mentioned is if you do it in a way, where it helps you hit the milestone of getting a big chunk of the time consuming tasks out the way. Then if you do it in a way where, so let's say for example, your deadline is next week, but you mm. manage to get it, you set your deadline for today. Then that gives you that week as a buffer to tweak it, to make the necessary adjustments. Um, yeah. To make it the best it yeah, can be. Like, so just up in your own discretion because like, everything everything you do like uh past that point is gravy like because the mm. the, the fundamentals of that work is so-called done like you don't have to worry about the about fulfilling the core purpose anymore i guess like mm -hmm. I, i'm assuming that deadline like give, like it, it just takes the boxes everything yeah, else is like exactly. a flurry you know, like yeah. a requirement so big, yeah so excuse me yeah it's about um yeah yeah, yeah i think ticking it, boxes is an interesting one like it is great if it's a case of just hitting tasks. Let's say you're on a production line, like yeah, you do want to tick those boxes. Yeah. And maybe for clients, like deadlines, uh, you know, th that's what makes that client work great because you know you have a set time to do things. And it also means yeah. that you're not holding up the client's um, mm. product uh, project because you're getting the stuff done. So there's something satisfying in knowing that you've hit your deadline. But like you mentioned on personal stuff, um, take your time like definitely set milestones mm. i mean let's say you look at ash Thorpe with his films like he does them for himself mm. they're his projects but he's been very open about saying that he sets a deadline because you know it gives it gives it a target to finish um to get it done by so that means you are getting the project done um but at the mm -hmm. same time there, there is is no harm in spending that bit of extra time to make it the best it can be especially with something you're trying to build that represents you 
Um, yeah. or, or maybe a be- better way to explain it is why ask yourself why you set that deadline. Is it if it's a case of just to improve your timekeeping skills and a way to manage your project and your the way you approach a project, then yeah, by all means, set your deadline and be strict with it to see as a challenge yeah. um, how quickly you can get a task done. Because you'd be surprised. You might think so. It might take you a month, but you might be able to do it in a week if you keep pushing that deadline back further and further and further. But if it's yeah. a case of um, you know you're not you're not doing it for a client, not maybe not looking to make money off it, um, but it's something that's like a release or like a, as a as a passion, like a, like you see people um, building their own cars or restoring cars, you know, it's quite <laughs> yeah. quite a common thing. It's like just take your time. It's almost like a project to do on a Sunday, and then you do it, and then when mm-hmm. it's done, it's nice. You enjoy it, and then then, then move on to the next thing. Um, speaking of the next thing what mm-hmm. um what do you think what area would you like to improve on like what area in terms of it could be skill set it could be life it could be anything that is kind of maybe not bothering you but something that's really kind of like chipping away at you and that's something that you want to either conquer or improve it could be a trait it could be a skill it could be a skill set what would it be well, something that comes to mind is definitely like um, the the lack of painterly strokes in some of the stuff I do. Um, mm. If not all of the stuff that I do, because last year, like uh, I I did take like jammers, like um, what do you call it? It was a um, motion. It was like it was like a film for concert art for film course. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. did do a like, for a few weeks. Um, it was really fun. Like that's where I really picked up Blender and stuff for like mm. uh, doing environment paintings or like putting stuff together. One of the things that he did mention to me, which I still haven't worked on, by the way, like uh, if Jamie, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. Oh my god, <laughs> etc. Yeah. Uh, because like uh, I, I, I really did continue doubling down on the 3D stuff, as I mentioned at the start. Um, because I am doing like my 3D printing stuff. Yeah. And I'm still working on uh like robots and stuff. And if I go into like the painterly design, I kind of feel like they might be mutually exclusive. Because if you do like um, a really close-up render, there's only so much that you can paint uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Because painting, painting in the way that um, con- uh, that I picked up over the years for, uh, especially if, as it pertains to like concept art, it's more about like getting like just natural like strokes or like implying, yeah. uh, implying detail and like suggesting mood that kind of stuff. Which is something that I also want to work on, like suggesting mood on just like environment paintings. Mm-hmm. Because if I take the designs and I do and I do too much detail on them, like, you're not going to see it if you zoom out. Which is why you don't see too many environment paintings on my uh, art station and stuff. Mm. Everything I do is, like, almost painfully close-up detail, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, which, is, which is fun in its own way. So, yeah, um, to answer your question, like, uh, I might try and work on my painting some more this year. I do have, like, some, like, um, some like, ideas for, like, sketches and, like, environments and stuff, which I haven't posted yet, by the way. So those are definitely mm. very much under, like, um, the personal portfolio um sort of uh sort of angle so whatever i've shown right now is like it mostly pertains to like 3d printing mm. which is something that i definitely like uh getting into and it's really fun actually like uh even if i couldn't even if i couldn't like find a way to commercialize it i would still do it on my own because as a hobby it's fun because i do do like um uh scale models and uh, the world game miniature painting, that kind of stuff. Like, I don't play the games, yeah. like the Warhammer stuff. I don't have anyone to play with. Um, so I just collect them and paint them, which is really fun on its own. It's another creative outlet, again. Mm-hmm. that's not in front of the computer, which is important, I would say. For sure. I mean, in terms of, like, hobbies, um, because it's weird, like you mentioned just now, it's like you're kind of combining professional skills, artistic skills, and a hobby in one. Yeah. Um, what, like other hobbies do you have that um that you that are very close to you or you know you find really important um most of the hobbies that i have like um besides like the the art anything that's not art related like as a hobby like maybe just like some like exercise or like watching like passively or watching uh movies shows and like playing games Mm -hmm. and stuff even that uh those aren't really like artistic those are kind of normal things that um, everyone else can enjoy, I guess. What kind of films? What what kind of like films are iconic for you? 
Well, uh, it's funny that you may, again, it's funny that you mentioned it because this morning, like, um, th there's this challenge on Facebook going around where, like, um, somebody nominates you and then, like, you put a, a still frame from a movie that was, okay. uh, which is really big in your childhood and that kind of thing. So I'm, yeah. I'm just going to shoot off one of these movies. Like, um, I think, well, th these are kind of, like, the, the usual suspects for us, like, who like concept art, right? Um, yeah. So it's, like, aliens. Like, just about anything that James Cameron has done, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of the Paul films like uh, Robocop, Total Recall, Starship Troopers, that kind of thing. Yeah, man. Um, of course, Star Wars, like um, The Empire Strikes Back is a huge one for me. Yeah. The Matrix, that kind of thing. Like Some of these are old movies like Ghostbusters as well. Like They're old for me. Like I was born, I was born in 1990, that kind of stuff. So yeah. uh, on, on, on Malaysian TV, we have like um, our satellite television, like we have reruns of like old movies on like uh, of of like Arnie and like uh, Sly Stallone going around shooting yeah, yeah, things. Yeah, 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 yeah. All those movies are fantastic fun for me. Like I, I, I'm pretty sure like I wasn't supposed to see all of those movies because <laughs> they, yeah, because even though I, I found this like after the fact, of course, because like uh, when I went to study in Australia and like Singapore, like I, I got to see these movies without censorship in the way mm. and stuff. Because like they, for some reason, like they never really censored all the violence, but they did censor like um, all like the the so-called romantic scenes and whatever kind of stuff yeah it's weird which is really odd like censor like the, the violence so I some of that like violence and all the guns and all those designs like they just translate into my work which is really weird Robocop but was I, an I interesting one um, for me sorry to interrupt um, is sure? again I'm the same like a lot of the things you mentioned growing up that's what was like the brain food um, for yeah, like you know just the imagination food. and Robocop is like one of my I just love that film. It's one of my all-time yeah, greats. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's so good. And I remember because it. like <laughs> it was like um because I'm born in '86. Um, so when these came out, it was like the VHS era where you could record yeah, yeah. it. And I remember Robocop was coming on, and the normally the films air at about like nine ten p.m. over here, and that's like when yeah. our bedtime used to be. And obviously the the opening scene. Sorry if you haven't seen Robocop. It is a spoiler, but it's kind of not. Well, yeah. um, it's oh, um, it's like you obviously know when he gets he gets uh, shut up by that gang um, at the beginning. Um, I remember like that being cut out, and that particular edit. Yeah. Um, but then when I watched it, I was like, okay, wow, because obviously it goes yeah, on for a fair bit on. of time, and he's just getting literally, you know destroyed yeah the, but, the um, thing that happens happens very intensely yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 but there's something like about paul verhoeven films and that particular era when it came to violence on film it's yeah it, it's 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 a weird one it's interesting um because it's not done the same way as it used to be yeah the strange Maybe thing about Robocop, the special effects i'm uh, not sure like, but it is weird violence. sorry uh, maybe it's because of the way special effects are done now compared to back then and maybe the yeah, sound design are, um yeah but, but it is different but yeah so you were saying about like um when you went to australia um and obviously mm -hmm. you saw the censored version first and the uncensored version yeah afterwards even though like australia is pretty uh, speaking of um censorship apparently like um when it came to robocop they had to reclassify that so-called like a uh, uh, 15 rating or 18 rating just for robocop because of how extra violent it was like even within that realm of movies of a, of a so-called similar violence or like mm -hmm. content like robocop just takes it much further <laughs> yeah i think it was intentional from the director yeah. i haven't apparently like he yeah, was, was he was yeah, high when he was just... making a lot of it um and it's when you look at it, like as as a kid or a younger person when you're watching it you just see the the technology you see the coolness of robocop and you know the explosions yeah. and the action but then when you look at it when you're a bit older it's like a satirical take on society where you have all the you know the commentaries about um how how the corporate world behaves, um, mm. the the ongoing the ongoing joke about I'll buy that for a dollar and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, it is almost like a snapshot of that time, and mm. um, he just turned the volume up like up to ten. Yeah, up to eleven, as it were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spinal. So actually, like speaking of which, like Spinal Tap was quite fun as well. I watched that one quite late, but uh, I finally understood what those like references were like when I went to Australia. Which one? Which one? Uh, Spinal Tap. There's this movie like uh, with, where it's like a mockumentary of those uh, those rockers. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, Spinal Tap was actually kind of fun. Um, I think I think it was filmed in England as well. Like um, okay, like it's a 
they, they're like a spoof of all like the uh, the British metal bands. So it's really fun as well. Like uh, those, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They look. If you've never seen like a, a a metal band like in concert or like uh, promotional videos and stuff, like they look how you would think they would look. <laughs> if you know what I mean, like it, again, like, I think it comes down to like concept art and like um the costume design. Like they just look how you feel like they they might appear. Like if you've never mm-hmm. seen them, like when you see them, it's like oh yeah. That's how I picture them in my head, even though I've yeah, never yeah, seen yeah. like one yeah. up close or something. Yeah, which is um, another intelligent choice by the filmmakers. You know, so it's a lot of like um, fun movies like that. You know, like they they got be because like the movies I watch. I remember one of my friends asking me back in the day, like Nick, don't you watch any like dramas or whatever? It's like no, uh, yeah. they, they don't particularly excite me. Yeah, uh, um, which is I don't and think is, it's is like that, a, is that still the case now for you? Was that sorry? changed? Uh, oh. Well, yeah, my my tastes haven't changed much over the years. Okay, it's yeah, like I, I'm still more action, sci-fi, that kind of thing. Like um, I was I was thinking about this like, recently, yeah. and like I've definitely got into appreciated more films that are like more character driven, more drama, more into like just you know like uh, I guess you could call them more more films in in a weird way as opposed yeah, to yeah. being blockbuster films. Um, mm. but at the same time, I'm I'm always still waiting for that that feeling of like, you know, when you're a kid, when you first see these, that Jurassic Park for the first time and those big blockbusters that actually make your jaw drop and really inspire you. Yeah. But I don't know, it's because I'm older now, but those feelings are very few and far in between now. And I seem to get mm. more satisfaction from like long form, long format, like as in TV shows, like Better Call Saul or shows like that, that are really like hitting all the beats that I want to oh. see. Um, whereas like certain films, unless they're something that I never expected, um, a lot of the mainstream stuff is kind of, I'd always give it a chance and I'm always hoping for it to be awesome, but it's almost like it, it's, it's a rare breed now compared to how they used to be. Yeah. It's gotten more rare. Like, um, speaking of like, I, again, I'm going to contain like, uh, my samples to like science fiction and stuff. Mm-hmm. I will happily enjoy like a slower, like more intelligent, like, um, or maybe a more carefully like made science fiction movie like uh both of the blade runner movies and like mm. um even star trek the motion picture the first one which was incredibly slow but it yeah like the ideas behind it were really cool and like um even if i weren't a concert artist i would still appreciate those because they give like good stories and stuff and the effects are really just the sideshow yes like you remember those true. scenes that you remember best like the themes of the movies and stuff mm-hmm. even like uh even like a so-called like dumb action movie, like which might be like Starship Troopers and like Robocop. There's a lot of stuff under the hood, which gets you yeah, thinking as well. Yeah, like yeah. Things, yeah. it's about I like humanity and especially like, when it comes to um when it comes to science fiction, it is a case of yes, you can always have like you can show the idea fully rendered, fully realized, but it is mm-hmm. for me the proper science fiction is it alludes to something that you, that you can't show and it yeah, makes you it really think and dwell on it. Um, and that for me is like if you get to that level and you can get your audience to think like that, then you've definitely succeeded. Yeah, like definitely, like it needs to tick the boxes on several levels, which is which might be why, like, if a movie is set in a contemporary time, if it's not like um some kind of thriller or something, it maybe doesn't catch my attention. But then again, like a lot of these movies, like set in more mundane settings, they have um they have other qualities, I guess. Sure. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. And it's like, they all have different I mean, I'm not, I like what I like, so to speak. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, it's like some films that just know the audience and they know, like, we're just going to give yeah. you a couple of hours to, you know, unwind, enjoy the show, go come along for the ride. Um, and then mm. some really, like, want to, wanna, you know, push the boundaries of their, their medium and really want to yeah. push storytelling. Um, aside from films, what about, like, games or books that have, like, influenced you and inspired you? Um, as far as books, like um, they again they they're mostly like science fiction books as well. Mm-hmm. But I do read like some. Uh, of course, I have read a lot of the rings. Like it took a while, but I, I read it. <laughs> so good, so good. Yeah, they're quite interesting though. Like um, it, it's weird. Yeah. How old were you when you read that? A uh, lot of the rings. I read it like way after the fact. Like uh, I had the benefit of watching the movies. Then ah, I picked I up the. Uh, I see. Yeah, I had the benefit of watching the movies way before like um picking the books up because I did get the books uh in my hands maybe a few months or a year after like the the fellowship came out. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think when I've the 
when we mm. watched Fellowship for the first time, I think literally within a few days, um, we had bought the books because it was a case of I don't want to wait a year to find out what happens next. Um, yeah, and stories were finished it, years uh, ago. I want to find out now. <laughs> exactly, yeah. and it's interesting, like how, firstly, how the how the I think it's an achievement how Peter Jackson and his team condense those books and its content into those three yeah. films. I think filming yeah, it back to back really, like really that. helped. Yeah. But it's it's one of the true successful adaptations. I'm sure there's people out there who would disagree and think that the books are better, which is totally fine. I mean, treat the books as the yeah. books and the film as the film. But it's, mm. I mean, how many adaptations have you seen where you know the source material and it just doesn't live up to it? But Lord yeah. of the Rings is a phenomenon. But even just the books themselves, the way Tolkien wrote them, and so he wrote them and when you read them i remember reading them thinking like you forget you're reading sometimes because your imagination's already yeah. you know you're you're already in that place and the fact that when he wrote them right. and and how much research he put into his universe the world building he did it's timeless that like you can pick that book up in 30 years time and it'll still be awesome yeah because yeah it's presented in such a way like um it's presented in that sort of way that it, even though like you make it like you can make it like dry to read but there's no mistaking what he wants you to see in your mind mm, you know what i mean exactly yeah it's he describes it in that way and everything think, like just is rolling and it doesn't stop yeah and like, as artists is that something to allude to um and aspire to be because it's all about like getting your idea out and realized and making sure the viewer gets it as well and yeah. um lord of the rings is a well the the whole trilogy is a great example of that it's one of the few examples that like you could say that's how you tell a story and that's how you you know world build and all that kind of stuff because um yeah man like reading it you just for me it's like i think some of the stuff that i like it is a bit of escapism like you do want to imagine these fantastical places and just things that could never possibly really exist, but you still, you know, as artists, you want to manage that anyway. And in in word form, he nailed it. Yeah. What about um, games? As far as games go, like uh, this year, I think the only game that, I, well, I should, that's not true. Like, I, I at least got one game that's not Doom Eternal, but yeah, speaking of Doom Eternal, that game is really fun. Like, um, it really forces you to like uh, be on your toes again can be inflexible and keep doing the same thing because you'll get punished, you know, that game, <laughs> you know, as artists and designers, like we, we know immediately like what works and doesn't work uh, most of the time when it comes to yeah. our, our own, uh, this, this doesn't look right. Yeah. When you play that game, like you do something wrong, like you just die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just get blown up. And like, uh, if you, if you do the right thing, like, um, uh, in regards to like, uh, in regards to countering your enemies and stuff, like blowing up the demons and stuff, yeah you you know if you're doing it uh quickly enough so because the game it does swarm you and it's it's not mindless you know it when when hugo martin said it's a game of uh what was it of, it's a bloody game of chess or something yeah it's, he's probably right you know mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, there is a lot going under the hood when you're playing the game and the game itself is reacting to your um uh what do you call it to your actions i guess so the game is really fun. Like I, I've confined myself mostly to um, like the really old strategy games, like um, like Red Alert Two, and uh, there is one Star Wars strategy game. Like it's called uh, Galactic Battlegrounds. It's a it's an Age of Empires clone, really. Okay. So those are strategy games and like uh, shooter games that I do have in my library that I try to play sometimes because like um, I do wanna like do, I wanna I wanna relax and I wanna mm. do something that's not like watching. It's, it's not just passively like consuming media right like i want to i want to have a bit of fun for like 15 or 20 minutes or something like that so yeah, those games yeah. are like yeah yeah like i think red alert and command and conquer have spent unhealthy amounts of time on those games um yeah. civilization oh, man, yeah. i really got into those as well um but up until like a few years ago i just had to stop stop games because yeah know, those just keep going right? yeah like if if i still played games i would not have an art career simple as that because I just yeah, yeah, way more. That's a horrifying thing. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm and grateful that I'm aware of my addiction to for, for it, but um, yeah, man, I'd I, I'd love to get to that point again where I can just you know I want to have a weekend, leave me alone. I'm just gonna play games, but I've just mm. I've just resorted to like 
because I still like there's certain games that like I just wish I really wanted to play and I keep putting mm. them off. Um, I think the last console I owned was a PS3. Um, even then I had to That's give it right. away because I knew like it was it was a distraction that I couldn't could not ignore if it was in front of me. Um, yeah. But um, I've resorted to like watching, you know, like let's plays and walkthroughs now. So I, I just I just live the game yeah. that way because up until before I stopped, I did prefer more like the single player games, like the story driven ones. So oh yeah, you know, like Metal Gear Solid and what have you. Like you can technically watch that as a film. It is practically a film in game form. Yeah. So you know, like some of those you can just watch, um, someone play for you, and you get the storyline that way, and you kind of get to see mm. some of that stuff as well. But I'd love to get back into gaming one day. Yeah. The, the, like, the Let's Plays, like, y- you can really live vicariously through it because there is one game. Uh, d- do you know, like, the Alien Isolation game that came out a few years back? Uh, yeah, I'm, f- I'm familiar with it, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, I I mean, there's a part, there's a tiny fraction of my brain that wants me to try it, but I know I hate it because, like, it's... Like, you can fight the Xeno in that one. You can only hide. Like, you can only discourage and then hide, which is... Uh. Which is really a counter to like what I normally play, which is like you can you can attack everything and like you can defend yourself quite easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, this interesting like, it's game trap though. Oh yeah. Sorry, you were saying? Oh no, no, it's it's, it's interesting game trap, but like uh, apparently that one's quite a scary game, and I'm yeah, good with scary games. <laughs> yeah. So the, I mean, the, add that to the fact that um, you know, if the if the game spooks me, like I can't do anything, like I'll probably just die and stuff. So I I can't find myself to just watching like a an expert play it because you know, uh, it, it's it's less stressful that way because again, like I, I play these games, like I want a challenge, but past a certain point, it just becomes stressful and it becomes an actual problem you have to solve because the game requires that of you. Mm-hmm. Like um, it's that true. That kind like... of way forward, not that to actual work instead. Um... My daughter got a Switch for Christmas, Nintendo Switch, but I found myself playing on it more than she has sometimes. Like she'd say, "Daddy, help me with this," and then I help her with it. And they were like, "You know what? I like this." And even then, like, um, usually people would see me on my computer working, and then all of a sudden, I'm just sitting there trying to complete this game on on the Switch, and I won't stop until I'm done. And I've done it where like I've got up super early just so I can play it, finish it, oh, and no. then and then stop it. So fortunately, those are out the way. I'm more in control of this issue, but uh, at the same time, it's like I've kind of somewhat successfully switched that energy to improving as an artist. But it's still there, mm. man. Gaming is my drug. Yeah. And, you know, I need to, I need to, I relapse sometimes. Oh man! Like speaking of uh, waking up to to play games, like I. Like, I've tried only a few mobile games in in the short time that I've had a mobile, uh, sorry, a smartphone. Like, because I, I've only recently adopted, like, maybe in the last, maybe five years, then I've started, like, using, like, smartphones, right? Because yeah. when I played those games, like, the, 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 the sad truth is that these games are just made to, they're not made as games. They're made as, like, money-making machines or mm-hmm. time wasters. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I foolishly got myself caught up in one of those games. Like, um, I didn't spend any money on it. I did put a lot of time into it. And, you know, I was like getting ice straight and stuff. I was like, oh man, you know, I spend so much time in front of a computer and I hardly ever feel this way. But this game is like, ooh, it's like doing all those horrible things to my eyes. So I just you, had to you stop know, playing. You know when you've played too much where you close your eyes and you still see the game in your brain? Yeah. And it's extra bad. Like, because like I got up and then like I started playing it and then, the, the, again, this is this is like uh, this is like assessing like uh, your work and like setting the arbitrary deadlines and like knowing when yeah. to stop. It's like, yeah, why yeah. am I playing this? Am I playing this because I want that like uh, time daily bonus or whatever it was free to play games? You know that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Or am I playing because it's fun? And the answer is, uh, it's not actually fun. I'm doing this because the game is encouraging me. Yeah, like, for sure. Like, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Built, in a way, I mean, it's they've gone like on the route because games have always had that thing where. Um, even like not computer games, just like any kind of play or game, it's about hitting a goal. And I guess it's that feeling of like, I've achieved the goal. I've got this yeah. score. I'm the best at this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then mm. a lot of them have taken that form of like, um, almost like gambling machines. They've kind of taken that form yeah, and yeah. mixed it in. And it's like, oh, you need your reward. Oh, you want to get super awesome at this? You need to buy this. And there's something about the human brain and the, you know, um, 
the reward mechanisms that the brain have when you achieve something, even though it's never really going to benefit you and your day to day. Um, yeah, they, they just they just know what that formula is, and they'll just keep going for that. But um, I guess it's just about being aware of knowing when to put it down. Like I've noticed where not even um with games like other stuff like um I mess about with music a bit sometimes or even just with art let's say I'm messing around in Houdini I've got another task I need to do but because it's like doing my head in the moment I've just decided that I'm just going to focus on messing around with this in Houdini which is not going to benefit me at all right now but I'm just going to focus on this for some reason so sometimes you use it without knowing to escape a responsibility um that you need to get done well at, at least when you when you have to like uh you have the itch to scratch or like that compulsion to do something in like yeah. uh, an art shop you probably get something out of it as opposed to play, just playing the game true, because true yeah like as well, opposed to like, like if it's on a five, on a five pro- play, on a professional anything. standpoint if you've got a deadline or you need to meet, meet it then that's probably a bit not a good look um yeah most thing but like yeah for sure if it's like just about you know let's say it's just about creating and there's no um it's not for in professional means then by all means experiment with all this all the good stuff like if you can turn yeah. that gaming energy into or well, not even gaming energy but that, that addictive energy to do stuff that really doesn't improve yeah. your craft to do something that does improve your craft why not yeah that's the nice thing about like um the, the addictive personality if you can like weaponize it to to do something like that benefits like the portfolio like 100%. i i i found myself like day and night like i'm about to switch the computer off but i feel the need to do something like my finger itches and like i don't want to play a game i guess i'll i just like continue doing that thing i was doing that i was supposed to take a break from yeah true. so yeah that, uh, which, uh, it happens I think that's a great way yeah. to look at it and even with like if you look at all of the all of the tools of making art at the moment like you know blender or all these other packages that you can use Mm. if you are looking away to like if some people are struggling like how how do i learn like i I don't have the energy or the willpower to learn if you do treat it like a game and think that okay i'm gonna give myself like say two weeks and if i get to a good level where i know this is going to benefit my workflow in two weeks then you're going to keep using it. That's like almost like a, a reward system that you see in games. Um, and if you can give yourself that kind of approach or use that kind of approach, then that might benefit you in the long run. And you are working towards your goal. So any minute you put into it will inevitably pay back until your goal is becoming a, a better artist or creative or whatever have you. Yeah. Uh, you know, in a, on a... This is about instant gratification, like getting the thing that you want quickest, right? Yeah. So yeah. what I found is that if you have that, again, going back to that compulsion of like, I want, I have this idea as well, or like I want to do this thing, but I don't want to, I don't want to wait. Get, if you're trying to learn a program and you, in fact, you don't know any programs on the computer to make art or something, uh, go read some forums or ask around, find out what programs load quickest and like respond quickly. Because I guarantee you, if you have an idea and you're meant to wait like 30 seconds or like a home one one or two minutes just to get the program going, you'll probably lose that steam by the time the, the program is ready for you, which is why which is why I enjoy something like Blender or like Moi 3D. Because when you press the button to open those, they open like they open almost instantly and you can begin doing what you wanted to do straight away. If you do if you do something with Maya or 3ds Max. For, even Photoshop, Photoshop makes you wait quite a while. So mm. if you want to get a sketch down, you probably just want to open like your sketchbook or like have a piece of paper and like just yes. just go ham. The, the the less you have to wait, uh, the better off you'll be. Like it's less frustrating as well. And like uh, it's like opening a bag of chips, right? If like let's pretend the chips in the bag are the thing that you want to achieve artistically or is your goal. But at the same time, like you're distracted and stuff. So if it takes like two minutes to open a bag of chips, you probably don't want the chips anymore. <laughs> but most chips, like you can open it instantly and like you can instantly gratify yourself. Yeah. So it's quick and easy, painless. You get what you want. So get yourself a program that doesn't get in your way, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Which is why, like, uh, again, like I, I enjoy like having those programs that open quickly because like 
sometimes you really do have to capture that lightning in the bottle of the inspiration or yeah, like well, that certain motivation. It's, it's like, totally true. Totally true. But, um, yeah. Um, Sorry, you saying? Been, we've been going on for about two hours now. So um, we, we can start looking at, at wrapping up. Um, uh, <laughs> just want yeah, yeah. to say like for the rest of 2020, as mm-hmm. has been predictable so far this year, um, what would what do you want to achieve by the end of the year? Well, uh, if at all possible, like I want to expand my uh, kit bash. Uh, I mean, because I do have a store on my art station. It's like mm-hmm. a kit bash of like components of like so far like there's the hard surface like gun components. Uh, I might expand that to other things, but uh, for the immediate future, like I'll, I'll probably add like more like additional art, like art that pertains to like uh, weapons and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that might be interesting. I'm sort of like trying to play to my strengths. Um, I'm gonna try some more 3D printing. Maybe I have my own designs because I I am designing the robot for um for my own portfolio and for the uh the actual physical product, right? Because the renders can be used on say a box. Mm-hmm. They can use the package item and stuff, which leads into itself. And um more sketching, more drawing, like uh I I, I with any luck, um the coronavirus situation will improve and like uh, some of these smaller companies that I'm trying to work with, like they'll pick up and have their funds again. Maybe I'll have, you know, uh, I'll, I'll resume working with them if, if their budget allows, which is ideal for everyone. Like if, if I can start working for them, they can get their product out. Then it's all good, you know. Hopefully, it just works out that way. Cool, dude. Anything yeah. you want to? Anything you want to plug? Obviously, you mentioned your art station store. Is it only art station you sell those kit bash pieces? Oh uh, yeah, I do sell those on ArtStation. Um, I don't have a gumbro or anything, so okay. everything that I do is on ArtStation. So yeah, if you want to read my blog, go over there. Like, if you want to contact me, just shoot me an email or message me there as well. Like, that's fine. Or you can find me on the uh, the Learn Square Discord. That's fine. Yes. Um, I do pop up there sometimes, not as often as I used to, admittedly, but um, mm-hmm. I am still there. Yeah. Cool man. Nicholas... Instagram as well. Yeah. Sorry? Instagram is. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. I'll, I'll definitely um put up all the links. Um, in the description so if you do want to check out Nicholas's work please do and um, check all that below uh, Nicholas thank yeah. you very much for joining me um, I know it's getting a bit late over there so thank you for your time oh, and, yeah, and it's a pleasure to talk to you again Aaron like uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a great chat yeah a huge thanks to Nicholas for being my guest you can find his work by checking out the links in the description Don't forget, all of our first lessons are free, so head on over to learnsquare.com to start your journey today. If you're liking the podcast so far, please like and subscribe and tell your friends. Till next time.